We're now entering part two, the modern methods of deconvolution. What we've talked about so far are the classical methods. They've been known for many years, but they have not been used successfully because of the sensitivity to data quality. Well, hopefully the modern methods will uh, get around that problem, and they do to some extent. The modern methods were introduced in 2002 by Thomas von Schroeter, a PhD student at Imperial College in London. A few years later, Leviton with BP extended his method, and after that, Ilk et al. in Texas A&M also extrapolated the method and used slightly different uh, ways of getting the information. So I'm going to review the three methods sort of briefly, and then we'll combine them all into one generic method. So what did von Schroeter do? Well, he didn't solve for the type curve. Usually, we get the derivative from the type curve. What he did was he got the type curve from the derivative, so he solved for the derivative. And the strength of his methods, actually, this application of the nonlinear regression, and he used the procedure called total least squares nonlinear regression, and we can minimize the error. He assumed that early time was controlled by Wellbore storage. Now, once he'd gotten the derivative that he was looking for, he integrated that derivative to give us the type curve. So that's a simple uh, mathematical procedure. And he introduced curvature control, which he called regularization. That's part of the total least squares procedure. It's a way of minimizing the errors while keeping control of the curvature. So we're actually, we're going to be demonstrating to you how that affects our answer, and it does affect it significantly. What did Leviton do? Leviton extended von Schroeter's method. He removed that assumption of early wellbore storage. He identified the problem that we've already seen in the classical methods, that when you don't know the initial pressure, there's significant problems that you're going to get with deconvolution, with any deconvolution process. So Leviton uh, highlighted that. But he showed us a way, possibly, of getting around that problem. If you have multiple buildups, not just one, and especially if that buildup occurs early in the life of the well, then you can get around this absence of the initial pressure. El Catal at Texas A&F did something different with their derivative. Instead of assuming points along the derivative curve, they assumed a continuous function consisting of B splines. So it's just the way they define their derivative. By defining it this way, their rates are, don't have to be step rates, they can be a continuous rate. So if you have a continuously de declining uh, flow rate, you can use this method very easily. And because they used analytical functions for the derivative, they're able to solve their whole problem in Laplace space. But we're not going to get into all the math today in this presentation. What I'm going to do is give you an overall picture of the procedure that they've used. Step number one, we're going to assume a derivative. It's a pure assumption. We don't know anything about it. We're going to assume it like this. Step number two, we're going to start somewhere. So we'll start with this. This is our type curve we're trying to generate now. We're going to start somewhere over here. There are easy ways of getting a starting point. It's very straightforward. Now we're going to integrate this derivative to get the type curve. Now that we've got our type curve, we're going to superpose, in other words, we're going to convolve this type curve with this multi-rate to generate this multi-rate behavior. Now we're going to compare this multi-rate behavior to measure data. There'll be an error. There'll be a difference between the white spots and the solid line here. We're going to quantify that error, and we're going to play with our derivative, change its shape, until we minimize the error. That's the procedure. What you see on the right is a flow and build up top, uh, test, 1,000 hours of flow and 500 hours of build up. The brown points are the measured pressures and the green line is the rate. So the rate was a flow and a build up. On the right is the derivative that we're starting off with. And you say, that's funny looking derivative, a flat line. Well, I didn't know where to start. So let's try here and see what happens. So let's start with a flat derivative. And from this derivative, we've been able to construct our type curve. That's very straightforward. Let's take this type curve and convolve it with the flow rate and shut in and generate our convolved pressure 
So the solid black line is what we calculated by convolution. Using this model, this derivative is a model of our reservoir. It's assumed. And you can see the black line, which is the calculated pressures, are nowhere close to the measured data. So this is not a good model. Well, let's try another one. How about this derivative? That looks more like the derivatives we're used to. Well, let's convolve this derivative again using the flow and build up data and match the calculated pressures with the measured pressures. And ah, it's different, but it's not good e either. So you can see that by changing our derivative here, we can modify it until we get a match of the pressure data. That's the whole point. So let's show you, using software, how this manual deconvolution would work. So let's start with this derivative here. I'm going to show you several things here. I'm going to show you the, how the derivative affects the type curve. And you can see that as I move my derivative points up and down, I actually change the shape of the type curve here and the corresponding convolution over there. I'm going to show you in this part that as I change my data, only the type curve after the derivative changes. The one before doesn't change at all. This part of the procedure shows that even though it's only the late time data that changes, on the drawdown, the late time data changes, but on the build up, it's the early time that changes. The late time doesn't change at all. So different parts of the derivative affect different parts of the flow and build up. So it can get, with multi rates, it can get pretty complex. You change parts here and things will change over there where you don't expect them to. But the mathematics is rigorous. So let's show you now how we're going to match this manually. I'm going to move these points one by one until I get, if you watch the right hand curve over here, you can see I'm approaching the match. Ah, it's not a bad match, you can do better, but if we can do better, why don't we let the computer do it better? Let's start over here. Again, arbitrarily, I could have started somewhere else, but let's start here and tell the computer, take this type curve, do the convolution, compare the calculated pressure with the measured pressure, and change these type curves point by point until you minimize this error. That's a pretty effective match. There's the derivative that the computer said will match this data, and you can see it matches the data very, very well. Well, one would say, well, what would happen if we, if we didn't start there, if we start somewhere else? Does it make any difference? Well, let's show you what happens when you start somewhere else. Let's start with a derivative that looks like this. It's an arbitrary choice. And again, very quickly, we have reached basically the same shape of the derivative and type curve, and we match the data exactly. So we can be very flexible and where we start, as long as we do a lot of iterations in the background, and the computer is able to do it very fast. Now, there are some places where if you start somewhere, you won't get a match. That's the problem with, uh, with most nonlinear regressions. They're non-unique, or they may converge to a local minimum. But as you can see in these examples here, we've had very, very good success. And indeed, I know the answer to this, because this is data that I generated synthetically, and this is the correct shape of the derivative. Let's show you. And if you don't like this shape, you can always modify it yourself. And you can see some parts of the data don't make any difference when I move the derivative and some parts do. This is a different test. The derivative looks different and will look different. What I have here is a 100-hour flow and a 1,000-hour, sorry, a 1,000-hour flow and a 100-hour buildup. And I'm going to start the derivative like this. And let's see where we end up. Let's zoom in on that buildup. And you can see that my derivative looks like this, and that derivative looks to me like a multi-layered reservoir, which indeed is what the data was. So the method can work very, very well. It can also fail, and I'll be demonstrating to you where it does fail. We've mentioned non-uniqueness. Let's identify that and illustrate it. What you can see on the right hand side here is we've got a very very good match of the calculated pressures and the measured pressures an excellent match now I'm going to change this derivative around this match was obtained with this derivative now I'm going to change it around and I want you to watch here nothing's happening okay so I still get a good match 
But what's, if you'll notice up here, the initial pressure that's back calculated from this does vary. But the match of my buildup doesn't change at all. Now, it doesn't mean I can change it anywhere I want. There are some parts of the data that I cannot change. If I change it, it'll match, it'll change over there. But you remember where we have that information gap between the duration of the flow and the duration of the buildup? I can do whatever I like here and I'll still get the same match. It doesn't matter. That was when the initial pressure was unknown. What happens when the initial pressure is known? Does it get any better? Well, let's try it again. Now you can see that if I move this derivative point up and the other one down, I can compensate. I can get a very good match. So let's stop it here. That's a very good match. It's as good as it was before. Let's move another point down and we'll move another point up and we can compensate for it. So which of these is the correct derivative? And the answer is, we don't know. It's non-unique. We've talked about, a little bit about curvature as one of the methods that are used in this uh, nonlinear regression. So let's talk to you a little bit about curvature. What you see here is the derivative, but it's very sharp corners. That's not a smooth curve at all. Look at the match. The match is perfectly good. What is built into a lot of these nonlinear regressions, which is called regularization, it's a fancy name, what it is, is we're going to prevent these derivatives from being so sharp. We're going to smooth the curvature. And of course, you can make them as smooth as you want. And I'll illustrate to you that the way you smooth these derivatives, the way you control the curvature, will affect your answer. So we've got to be very, very careful about this. So, obviously, this is a good match. This derivative could be the answer. But from a reservoir engineering perspective, we know that Reservoirs don't behave that way. Mathematics doesn't care. It behaves this way. Let's illustrate to you what happens when you add curvature to this thing. So I'm going to go to the curvature control, and now I'm going to let the software deconvolve. And now you can see it's make, making all these things very smooth. My match here hasn't changed at all. Which match is better, the one or the other? They're both very good. One looks better than the other. doesn't mean it is better. What I've just done now is change the curvature to a higher number so to make it smoother and look at the shape of my derivative. It has changed significantly. When I look at this derivative, we know for this particular one that the answer actually curves down like this and it's a constant pressure system. When I look at the one with the lots of curvature, it more looks like a linear reservoir. It's the wrong picture completely, so it is wrong. But it looks good. So all these methods, the modern methods, use this total least squares minimization. Remember what they're doing is they're calculating the error between the measured data and the calculated data. So measured and calculated, so there's the pressures. We'll square it to get the least squares, and we'll apply a weighting factor to it. And we'll do the same thing to the rate. These methods are really powerful. If there are errors in the rate, we can actually correct for that too. And they're very effective that way. So there's another control for the rate. And there's the third control here for the curvature. So depending on how I control my curvature, I can minimize my error to a different degree. And I can affect the shape of my curve. So these are the external constraints we've been talking about. Let me show you when deconvolution works and when it doesn't work. Let's take the case of a long, narrow reservoir. We've got 1,000 hours of flow and 100 hours of buildup. And we know the initial pressure. If we were to do well testing, we would analyze the build-up data, and that's what the build-up time curve would look like. And we know it, at the end here it is wrong because it's build-up, not drawdown. Well, let's take this same data and deconvolve it. All we're taking is the build-up data and deconvolving it, and that's what the deconvolved data looks like. And if you will notice here, this looks like a half slope, which represents linear flow, and this looks like boundary-dominated flow, which represents a finite reservoir. And indeed, the true answer is this yellow line, and the deconvolution has done a wonderful, wonderful job. And this is an example of, it's extremely useful, it's much more useful than the build-up type curve that we had. This is an example of success. What happens if we don't know the initial pressure? In this particular example, we're still able to get the correct shape of the type curve, and that's because there was enough information in that part of the build-up to actually guide us there.
But that don't, doesn't always happen. Let's take a different reservoir. This is a two-layered reservoir with no flow boundaries and constant pressure boundaries. We have a thousand hours of flow and then hundred hours of build-ups and we know the initial pressure. So again, we're going to take the build-up data and analyze that. If we were doing a well test analysis, this is the type curve we would get, the derivative. When we do the deconvolution, this is what we get. Now this reminds us of a constant pressure system, and indeed this is what we have here. Let's compare it to the true type curve and derivative. There's the true derivative. It didn't quite get it, but it's pretty close. At least directionally, we're all right. Let's take the same data set, but this time we've got an extra build-up over here at the front end. There's the first build-up from well test. There's the second build-up from well test. This is the deconvolution. And this is the true answer, the yellow line. It's done a fantastic job. If the initial pressure was not known, but we still have the two build-ups, it does a fantastic job again. So that second build-up is substituting for the absence of the initial pressure. Let's show you where deconvolution fails. Okay. This is a similar model to the one we've looked at before. So you know the shape of the type curve. This time the initial pressure is unknown. And look at the resulting deconvolution. Completely wrong. This is the answer. That's the correct one. What this is the same process that worked very well before. With this particular data set, it doesn't work. And yet it looks good. So you don't know that it's not working. So you've got to be careful how you interpret deconvolved data. Let's take the case where this time we know the initial pressure, but my buildup's too short. Can I compensate? for a short build-up by deconvolution is the answer, is the question we're trying to answer here. And the answer is no. There's the deconvolution and there is the true type curve. What happens when we don't know the initial pressure or it's wrong by a certain amount? So what I'm going to demonstrate to you is three different derivatives and type curves that I obtain depending on which initial pressure I assume. If I assume 5,000 PSI, I get this, 5,300, I get this line, and if I assume 5,678, I get this one here. Well, which one is the correct one? We don't know, depending how wrong or true that initial pressure is. And often the initial pressure we don't know very well, or it's wrong, it's got errors built into it. So it can create an error in the shape of the deconvolved information that you get. Let's talk about a case where we don't know the initial pressure. Why? Because this well was drilled, was fracked. We cleaned up the frack and then we put it on test. So we don't have an initial pressure. But we have a good build-up. Can we get the computer to back calculate the initial pressure? So we put PI on auto. Well, remember, how do we start this thing? What we're going to do here is start it as if the derivative was going down. And this is what we end up with. Now I'm going to start it with a different derivative. And this is what I end up with. And I'm going to start with a different derivative, and this is what I end up with. So depending on where I start, I end up with three different shapes, but also three different initial pressures and significantly different. Which one of them is correct? We don't know. There is no way of knowing. There's total non-uniqueness here. The true number was 5678, somewhere in here. And anyhow, the shape of the derivative is wrong. We have a problem when we have inconsistent data. What do we mean by inconsistent data? Well, during production or even during a well test, things change. The reservoir and well bore conditions don't stay the same. For example, the skin can change during flow. Or my well bore storage can change from liquid filled to gas filled. Or while I'm flowing the well, I get liquid loading. So many operational problems. I'm going to show you the effect of that. Let's take the case here where these two buildups have actually got different well bore storage. That happens quite a bit. So there's the one buildup, and there's the second buildup. So you can see the reservoir characteristics are still the same, but the early time data, the well bore storage is different in each. So if we took the data from both buildups together and say, okay, go deconvolve these things because there's an advantage in using multiple buildups, this is what you'll get. This is what you'll get if you use small curvature. If you use a high degree of curvature control, you'll get the red line here. Neither of them is correct. At the front end here, it's wrong because it's doing something in between the two. 
and at the tail end, it's wrong. So when you have inconsistent data, uh, things can be put off quite a bit. Here's a production data set. We have one, two, three, four buildups. Let's look generally how consistent or inconsistent they are. This is what the derivatives look like. These things should be overlaying each other if they were consistent. So when we come to analyze this data, we really can't use all four buildups simultaneously because we're going to get a mishmash. We've got to decide on one of them to use as our primary buildup. If they were consistent, then we could use all four together and get much, much better data. So the first thing we have to do when we're using deconvolution is test for consistency of the data. So there are many reasons why deconvolution fails. Inconsistent data, noisy data caused by outliers or poor filtering of the data, build-up periods that are too short, reservoir or wellbore dynamics that are inconsistent, and the mathematics is not designed for handling those. Deconvolution works with linear differential equations. Inappropriate curvature control, if we use too much or too little, we can get the wrong answer. If we have too many data points, the, the number of calculations done here are sometimes number in the millions, and the round of errors can actually add to our problem. So often we have to reduce the number of data that we use for analysis. And of course our starting initial conditions, our starting unknown initial pressures all cause us problems and cause deconvolution to fail. Deconvolution is in many respects very different from modeling, but in its operation can be very similar to modeling, in its use anyway. So let's talk a little bit about the relationship between de deconvolution and modeling. We've talked a lot about deconvolution, let me talk a little bit about modeling. In well testing, when we've got pressure data and we want to analyze it or to model it, what we do is we pick one of these models based on external knowledge. We talk to the geologists, we talk to our production people, our seismic people, so we have an idea of what our reservoir should look like and we pick an appropriate theoretical model. In this particular example, we've chosen a rectangular reservoir with a constant pressure boundary at one end. Let's say there was an aquifer at this side or something. And we fill in all the information we can about that reservoir, its permeability, its damage, its size, and so on. And we use the model, we convolve with the various flow rates, and we get a flow and build up calculation, and we compare the calculated pressures to the measured pressures. So you can see at this point, we're very similar to what we did with deconvolution. In deconvolution, we got our type curve, and then we reconvolved it to get this signature here, and we tried to minimize this, and we do the same thing in modeling. So what we're going to do in modeling is go back to the reservoir models here, change the permeability, change the skin, change the reservoir shape until the calculated line matches the measured data. So you can see the similarity between convolution and modeling. But modeling has its problems because, first of all, we need to know what the reservoir model is, uh, and sometimes we don't. And if we use different reservoir models, we can get very similar looking matches, but very different characteristics of the reservoir. So we have the non-uniqueness in modeling. And of course, that reservoir model that we've chosen actually can be represented as a type curve, which is a representation of all these reservoir characteristics. Let's compare deconvolution and modeling. Deconvolution extracts the underlying drawdown type curve from multi-rate data. Well, so does modeling. It just does it differently. In modeling, you choose the reservoir, and de depending on its permeability and reservoir shape and so on that you put into it, you will get the underlying drawdown type curve. You will get the underlying unit rate function. Deconvolution generates the total test duration, not just the build-up data. We said that was one of the advantages of deconvolution. Well, so does modeling. Modeling will match your whole thing from time zero to, to the end of your test. Deconvolution thereby increases the radius investigation because it models the whole time. Well, so does modeling. It's identical. De deconvolution can determine the initial reservoir pressure. Notice I put a question mark there because that's very iffy. Sometimes it can, sometimes it can, and sometimes we don't know with what quality we're getting the answer. Well, modeling can do exactly the same thing. You can back out an initial pressure, and that initial pressure, just like in deconvolution, 
the initial pressure that you got depended on the shape of the derivative curve in the same way here in modeling the initial pressure will depend on the reservoir model and the shape of the reservoir that you've chosen. Now, deconvolution, we don't need to worry about whether we're using superposition time, log, log superposition or square root superposition or material balance time. We use those when we're analyzing pressure data in a well test. When we're modeling a well test, we don't use those. We use the actual full convolution time, just like the convolution process does. So they're identical. Deconvolution does not assume a reservoir model. That's absolutely true. In modeling, we have to assume a reservoir model. So that's the weakness of reservoir modeling. And the apparent strength of deconvolution is that we don't have to assume a reservoir model. But instead, we've assumed a mathematical model, which is better. So deconvolution, the modern methods are very robust because of this total least squares, multivariable, nonlinear regression with curvature control. So it's a, it has become a viable tool. It allows us to accommodate errors in both the pressure data and the rate data. It can be a useful diagnostic tool, but we've got to use it with caution. It's not a silver bullet. A big advantage is we don't have to have a preconceived idea of what the reservoir looks like. The idea is, once we've deconvolved it, the type curve that results will hopefully point us to what the reservoir looks like. It has limitations. The answers are non-unique. They can be misleading. Because of that, the answers are approximate, and therefore they must be used with great caution, and they must be used for diagnosis only. In other words, I would not recommend that you generate a type curve using deconvolution and go match that type curve with the reservoir model. You've got to be very, very careful. There are some things that deconvolution cannot model because of the external constraints that we apply to it. If we have phase redistribution, the phase redistribution says your derivative is going to go negative. The deconvolution process that we've used says the derivative cannot be negative. So there is no hope of being able to model a phase redistribution and other uh, artifacts like that. So the resulting deconvolution would be completely the wrong picture or could be the wrong picture. It is extremely sensitive to inconsistent data, and inconsistent data occur very, very often. If the buildup is too short, the type curve can be wrong. When we're doing nonlinear regressions in modeling, we have a certain number of parameters, the permeability, the length of the reservoir, the skin, and so on, and we're trying to optimize those. In Deconvolution, we're trying to optimize every point on that derivative curve. So there's many, many more unknowns than in models. Primary pressure derivative is not honored in deconvolution. What does that mean? It means that uh, sometimes, because it's a mathematical process, it doesn't care uh, about the shape of the derivative. The only control it has is the curvature. So the shape of the derivative can be completely wrong so that even non-physical things can be represented mathematically. The primary pressure derivative has taught us that there are many things that are non-reservoir effects that can be detected, and deconvolution does not honor that. In order to implement the, the primary pressure derivative in deconvolution, we have to do constrained least squares, and we have not done that yet. So the features that deconvolution sees may have nothing to do with real life at all. It's a mathematical feature that it has discovered. The feature that we see depends on the degree of curvature we've applied, and that's a matter of judgment. The math, uh, the, the deconvolution is based on math, not physics. There are gaps in the data, and those gaps are filled in mathematically with no regard to the reservoir model itself or to the flow regimes, and that's not a good thing. Data errors will affect the shape of the deconvolution curve. Thank you for your time. I hope you've enjoyed this technical presentation. For further information, visit our website. I'd like to acknowledge Sarah Farshidi, who helped us a lot with the programming of this deconvolution procedure, and Dilham Elk, student, PhD student at Texas A&M, for his contribution too. Thank you very much.